So there is a fair amount of literature on bracing and long-term history, um, but you also have to keep in mind what type of brace was used in that study. So the brace that's up here is not a brace that probably anyone in this room ever wore. This is a Milwaukee brace, not even used in Milwaukee anymore. Uh, but it was very cumbersome, it was very uncomfortable, and on average could be removed just to take a shower every day. Uh, and many of these patients were braced for an inordinate amount of time, 23 hours a day, up to age 17, sometimes even 18. So we have to keep some of that in mind when we're comparing the different studies that are done, what brace was used in the study. So one of the biggest studies that was done uh, was by Nockamson uh, looking at AIS patients treated with this Milwaukee brace. He looked at 85 patients that were uh, treated till skeletal maturity with a follow-up of about 7.5 years uh, and then a normal control group. And there was really no difference in function, marriage rates, childbearing, et cetera. It was one of the first studies to suggest that multiple pregnancies could be a possible risk factor for progression. No study has borne that out since, so most of us feel that that is not a, a true statement. In the late 60s, uh, the hospital that I'm from, uh, the DuPont Institute in Wilmington, Delaware, created this brace on your right. This is called the Wilmington Brace, and it was the first time an underarm brace was used in the United States. It's a custom-made brace that's molded to the patient's individual curve. Uh, some of you in this room may have worn the brace next to it, which is a Boston brace. Same concept, it's just that the shell is off the shelf and the orthotist strategically places pads inside the brace to gain the same type of correction. And there's probably no difference between either brace in terms of outcome. When I got to DuPont 21 years ago, I decided to try to bring back that first group of women that was ever treated with this underarm brace. In fact, I met the woman uh, who started that revolution because she refused to use the brace with the metal uh, part that goes up to the jaw. So she just wouldn't wear the brace. And she said, I'll wear the bottom part, but I'm not wearing the top part. And that became the first Wilmington brace. So one, one girl's... Uh, uh, defiance created a revolution. Um, so I reviewed uh, 605 charts um, of women braced between 73 and 83, uh, had specific inclusion criteria, 91 met that inclusion criteria. Um, I was able to contact 65 of them and 55 returned back to DuPont uh, to be interviewed, x-rayed, and fill out a questionnaire. So my inclusion criteria, they had to be 10 years or older at the time of diagnosis, uh, skeletally immature with a curve between 20 and 45, and at least documented compliance. And compliance is a very difficult thing to measure. So we ask the patient, we ask the parents, does she wear the brace? They say yes. We have to take their word for it. We do have the ability now to place a compliance chip inside your brace. So the brace can tell us how many hours a day you actually wear it. So the kids come in and they can scan the brace and we can find out exactly how much they wear. They had to have at least two years of treatment, and they had to wear the brace until full skeletal uh, maturation, risk or five. They were not uh, able to have had surgery, and we needed complete records. Um, the mean age at start of treatment was 12. They wore it till they were about 16 for an average of about four years. And the average age of the women that I interviewed was about 31. They had a physical exam, we did x-rays, and most of them had not had any x-rays since they left DuPont, and we used a validated spine questionnaire that I gleaned from Dixon in the literature. Um, um, and it's a questionnaire that we don't use anymore, but it looks specifically at 26 activities of daily living, specific physical, functional, positional, self-care activities, um, and uh, overall assessments of their appearance, um, self-image, and severity of any back pain. So it's a pretty inclusive questionnaire. The hard part was finding a control group. So I had to find women who were the same age, had the same number of children, were in the same type of occupation, who didn't have scoliosis to fill out the same questionnaire. And I had a killer med student who did all that work for me. She would literally walk up to women in the hospital and say, are you a 43-year-old lawyer with three children? And I said, <laughs> I said yes. She, she got them over. So she, that was Lillian Rich, and I owe her a, a debt of gratitude for this paper. Um, so we'll look at the results. 13% um, of the patients did demonstrate a small increase in their curve, all of them less than 10 degrees, ranging between about 5 and 10 degrees. Any apparent correction that was obtained with the brace, and some of these kids kept that correction for two years after the brace was discontinued, was lost at the final follow-up. So I didn't see that as progression because they returned back to the curve at which they started. And those of you that wore a brace were probably told our best possible outcome is going to be for you to end up with a curve exactly the same as we started the day we braced you. So I didn't see that as a failure. Uh, and no patient required surgical treatment uh, at the time of final follow-up. 
So if you look at back pain, the percentage uh, listed first is the braced patient versus um, the uh, control group. 67% of the braced uh, patients had little or no uh, pain compared to 82% of the control group. So 20% of the control group who were women around age 37 still complained about some back pain. 31% um, of the braced patients versus 15% had considerable pain, and both uh, percentages for severe pain was quite low, and about the same. There was really no significant overall difference in the 26 physical, functional, positional, and self-care activities, except the braced women had a little more pain with shopping. I don't know what that means, because we didn't define exactly what they were shopping for. So maybe it was shoes, maybe it was groceries, I don't know. Sitting and sideline. 93% um, rated their cosmetic appearance uh, as the same or slightly improved since, uh, since the brace was discontinued. 98% rated their self-image as the same or improved. Um, we'll look at a couple other studies that mirror my study, um, also looking at underarm bracing. Uh, a 16-year uh, follow-up by Danielson, also uh, Nockamson, um, who was, uh, did many of the papers that Steve quoted. Uh, he looked at 41 braced patients for 65 untreated AIS patients, mean age 32 years. Equal curves between both groups. The brace group had no deterioration in curve magnitude beyond their initial curvature, so these were all brace successes, and no patient required surgery. Uh, Danielson, uh, in 2010, published a, a study of 37 braced patients versus 40 untreated uh, scoliosis patients, again, mean age 32, average curve 30 degrees, and he found no difference in health-related quality of life scores between the two groups. So in summary, we can say that most curves treated successfully with a brace will not progress through the fourth decade of life. And most brace patients function nearly or as well as patients without scoliosis and as well as patients with scoliosis that was not braced. So the outcome for bracing, if it's successful, is very favorable. Thank you.